have. Welcome back, everybody, to another session of Simple Layman. We are so incredibly blessed to have you join us today as we open the Word of God and rejoice in the good, kind mercy of the Lord and giving us His Word. So incredibly blessed to be joined by sweet brother Brett, and there's the other guy, Reggie, and... Uh, <laughs> Sweet brother Brett and the, I like that. And the other guy, <laughs> see, look, I got a smile out of both of them. Come on. That's all we're after here. Nice smile. Actually, what we're doing this afternoon is we are, we're looking for the direction God would have us to go because the Bible is so incredibly replete on the subject that we're going to be looking at this afternoon that we're trying to just find the right way to frame what we'd like to say. And so what we were discussing and talking about uh, that we wanted to get back into is we've been doing a, uh, we did one other session on uh, discovering or thinking through the history and the background of the Antichrist. <clears throat> the reason this becomes such a familiar topic for people today, because it seems to be the conversation that is on a lot of people's lips, as people are really trying to make sense of a lot of things that are happening around them in the world. And so they have these lists of things, or they have ideas about how it is that they are formulating what the Antichrist could and what he couldn't be. And in the last session that we did, when we put some of this together, we tried to approach it or build it from a bit of a, uh, a spiritual type of background where we carved out a case, as it were, for the Antichrist um, being the problem that the Bible presents as a foe continually throughout the whole of the Bible as he shows up time and time and time again. There are many types of Antichrist. Goliath is a type of Antichrist. You have uh, uh, different people, the, the king of Assyria, the king of Babylon. You know, you have uh, different peoples along the way who become a type of an Antichrist. But there's a big difference when you start bringing the practicality of the problem of the Antichrist to bear, because some of our brethren that we think are doing, or we share many, many things in common with, would see this as a revival of just an empire. Some of our brethren would tell us that the Antichrist is something that is just a, a force or a, a type of evil that works in the earth that is an anti-Christian bias against us in all of these ways. Some people want to tell us or would like to make a case for us that the Antichrist is uh, Nero. Uh, he was uh, back in the uh, early, uh, what is that, uh, just right after the, the death of Christ into the 100s or so, you had Nero, you had Domitian, you had all of these people that were wicked and persecuting the church, and, and they find a historical fulfillment in it from that uh, perspective. But, you know, the real problem doesn't have anything to do with the person of the Antichrist. Because when you're trying to discover the person of the Antichrist, the real problem we have to deal with is what does the Antichrist want? Because that sets up the whole of the argument as to how the context of the Antichrist develops. He can't be a Western American leader. He has to be somebody that has a keen interest in the affairs of the nation of Israel because he has a vested interest in what happens to that little sliver of land that God is in covenant with, and God is in covenant with that people. God is in covenant with that city, Jerusalem. God is in covenant with that temple mount. And God will ultimately reside on that throne. And so the way in which the kind of the way it has to be set up is that the geography becomes a lot of the issue because setting in the temple means the world to Satan, if you understand what I'm saying. 
setting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So I'd like you to open your Bibles, if you would, just to kind of start this off. And let's jump into, we want to go to 2 Thessalonians. And the reason I want to go to 2 Thessalonians is because I want us just to look at a little bit of what Paul is concerned about as he's thinking about the context that the Old Testament develops for him to understand these things. And so Paul doesn't address this. This is just a fledgling little church. Paul had first started the church uh, there in Thessalonica, and he was with those people for somewhere around three weeks. And he was telling them all that was going on And he did not neglect to share these incredibly vital truths with them. And then he sent back, you know, another letter to know how they were doing. But he also began to, it seems somewhat odd, is is what I'm saying. It seems somewhat odd that if you went out and you started a church, that one of the very first things that the Apostle Paul felt it necessary to make sure that they understood clearly was the Antichrist, that he wanted them to have a knowledge of the second coming of Christ that would spare them some of the problems that were overtaking even the church of his own day. And so when we start reading in 2 Thessalonians, it says, now brethren, in chapter 2, now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and of our gathering together to him, we ask you, not to, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. By spirit, by word, or by letter. I don't know if I said by word there, sorry. By spirit, by word, or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Now, let's just stop right there. When you think about what the Apostle Paul is dealing with, isn't it interesting that he would, he would have to tell those people, the day of Christ has not already happened. Now, why would that become the issue? Well, he's going to talk to you about the very first thing he's going to begin to deal with is that there is a deception that is going to pervade the earth, and then he's going to give you some reasons. But There's a, somebody could have fallen prey to a false spirit. They could have preached a soulless message. They could have heard something, uh, a word that they had heard or something, and they spoke that word, they preached that word, and they lied about what was going to happen. And then there could have been a a letter that somebody had forged their names to and had upset the church, telling them that the day of Christ had already come. So what is it, Brett, Reggie, what is it when you think about this, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. What is it about the coming of the day of Christ that the Apostle Paul is going to focus and narrow these people? Why, what were these people in Thessalonica hearing, and what was it that Paul was trying to correct? Thoughts? I think it had to do with the presumption it's just an inference, and of course, Paul covers a number of bases there. But he did add, our, a letter as from us could very well have been that they had misunderstood his first epistle. Not all of Thessalonica, Thessalonicans, of course, but some, those that were spreading this error, had very likely supposed that when G- Paul talks about, we shall not all sleep, we shall all be changed, that he was talking about something that was very imminent. And... Um, Wow, You're many translations. First Thessalonians 4. 4, yeah. 4, I think it's what? 13 through 13, 17. Four. Yeah. So it's it's very possible. And then after right after that, he goes right into talking about the day of the Lord. You have no need that any man, you know, it comes to the thief. So they could have thought 
the, the thief-like coming of the day of the Lord and the, and being the, the, and the catching up of the believers to be reunited with their departed loved ones that had gone to sleep in Christ could have thought that that was on the immediate or soon horizon and began to spread that with with a certain ac- excitement that was and then Paul wants to check that with a great sense of urgency and I'll tell you why you know I don't think it's like some commentators suggest that Paul was careful that they were just being diverted and distracted and neglecting their normal responsibilities <laughs> like they say their day job so to speak it's not I don't think I don't think that's all there is to it Paul used this language very significantly that we see Jesus use. When Jesus was asked by his disciples, what should be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? Significantly, the very first thing that, that he said was, take heed that no man deceive you. And he goes on to reiterate and underline and reinforce that theme of the danger of deception, of misunderstanding those days of great deception and great trouble. Uh, that was a peril that very much concerned Jesus and Paul, I believe, picking up on that, sees that this premature announcement of the Lord's imminent return, or some say that's translated as though the day of the Lord was already here. And that's a whole discussion. I think Paul is talking about that the day of the Lord is that they were the false report is I believe they don't they're not saying, of course, that Christ is already here. I mean, Paul is writing them. They know that what they're thinking is. One of two things, either the day of the Lord is some kind of long period of time that's already set in, like a time of trouble. That's the pre-tribulation position. But I think rather, and there are many great, notable Greek scholars like J.B. Lightfoot and a good many who say what they were actually saying by the use of the Greek word anestikin is that the day of the Lord was impending. Not like just might potentially happen any time, but most certainly was just about to happen. In other words, the Lord was at the door. There was literally no time. He has not arrived yet, but he's very near to arriving. That's the way I think that it should be translated. And I, it, it, you know, in most, in many translations do do that. Now back to the point. So Paul is rallying with a great urgency to quell, to, to put down this air because it threatens not just a momentary temporal distraction. It actually militates against what Jesus lays down as the necessary signs and preliminary events that must come first. And therefore, if that is denied or ignored um, or neglected, it really opens the Thessalonian, the Thessalonian church to this great end time deception. In other words, Paul's looking beyond just momentary temporal distraction to a deadly error that threatens the believers to, to recognize the, the necessary events that must happen first. He's, he's going to go on in just a moment to talk about the necessity of a of a great rebellion some translations say falling away i don't think that's the best way to understand that but it's it's a revolt a rebellion and um and some translations have it that way i think preferably and and it leads immediately to the the revelation of the man of lawlessness who must come first he's basically saying simply this jesus can't come now as you're announcing and expecting because this man has to be revealed first. And don't you remember when I was yet with you, I went over this with you. I, I, how, what else can we understand? And then if, if Paul had three weeks with these people, he very doubtless s- mentions those things, which he, he says, I have told you these things before. And when he says that, he goes on to talk about the Antichrist. Well, what, what did he tell them bef- before? Most evidently, Paul told them the Olivet prophecy of Jesus. And how that Jesus sends his own disciples back to Daniel. And what are they going to find there? They're going to find this man who desecrates the temple of God in Jerusalem before that starts the tribulation. That must be, you know, these things must happen first. And then Jesus comes in the clouds of glory and so forth. This is the Olivet Prophecy. So Paul is simply going to review with them what he went over with them before. And then when he reviews it, he's going to say, now it's all cleared up. Now you understand. Uh, and don't you remember, I went over this with you before. So he has to go back and reestablish what he established with him when he was there at his earlier visit. And, and they, have, they have let that slip. And Paul is correcting them, bringing them back to what he went over th- with them before. But my point here, I think the most important point is when Paul says, let no man deceive you by any means, he's echoing the very words of Jesus. He say, sees this 
error as subversive to the truth that will protect the saints against the great end time deception that Jesus speaks so much about in the Olivet Prophecy. Back to you. Well, see, I think that you 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 look at the the way you're describing that. Then, see, you're saying that that the way in which the day of Christ had come, it was imminent. It was about to be here. Right. And this was affecting how these people were living in some way. And Paul thought it enough to go ahead and jump in in chapter one. And he's giving you what the real issue is in chapter one, when he says, I'm just going to pick up in verse uh, five, or excuse me, verse six of chapter one of second Thessalonians, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation, those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony was believed among you. Now, here's the point. What's he saying right down the road? He's telling them, let's talk about what day is that going to be? The gathering together uh, of, of us to him has everything to do with understanding the context of the day of the Lord because then he's going to say word, letter, or spirit, word, or letter, as if from us, as though that day or the day of Christ had come. Obviously, the day of Christ has not come because the vengeance, the fire, all of these other things have not taken place. And so what I'm suggesting to you is that the geography, the part that I was talking about earlier, the geography of the problem plays out because Paul's immediately going to shift your attention away from looking for just the simplicity of the singular day to he's all of a sudden going to drive you back in verse three to say, the very first problem you have to think about is Daniel eleven twenty four. 24. After the league is made with him, he shall act deceitfully. He's going to talk about Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means. Reggie brought out Matthew chapter 24, Jesus' verse, let no one deceive you. You know, many shall come in my name saying, I am the Christ and shall deceive many. So, so the deceptive aspect is where the center of this is really the epicenter of the whole problem is going to take place. And then he says, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. And then he's going to launch off. And the geography I'm talking about is he's instantaneously going to tie you to a Jewish temple. He's going to bring the Antichrist in, tie you to a Jewish temple, and then he's going to circulate around that or hover around those two issues and he's going to begin to talk about what kind of man is this antichrist what is it that the antichrist seeks to accomplish and so there's all kinds of of things that i'm i'm trying to get at here but i just want you to be able to paint the picture in your own mind the apostle paul has a grid out of the Old Testament by which he is working. And that grid is something that he has to use. He doesn't have anything else to look at to make his arguments from. And so the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, Daniel 7, 13, or our gathering together to him, Daniel 12, 1 and 2 and 10, as though the day of Christ had come, Zechariah 14, 4 through 6, the falling away comes first, Daniel 11, 30 through 31, the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, Daniel 7, verse 8 and 17 and 25, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, Daniel 8, 24, 7, four through eight, or he who now restrains will do so until he was taken out of the way, Daniel 8, 11, and 12, 1. There's all kinds of things that the apostle Paul has as a grid in his mind. So 
that's where the Antichrist begins to take formulation in the thought of the Thessalonian church. Can I just insert that if you look, again, you know, I never know what you're going to come to next. Go so ahead, maybe, brother, throw it out there. I may be covering ground that you're already going to cover, uh, but just in case you don't. Um, and by the way, you might, do you have a chart? You know, you just read off a list of scriptures. If yeah. you throw that chart up, you know, Here you these go. videos are something that people could come back and look at. And that would give them those references and everything that would give them that grid. Uh, I, I think you showed it to us earlier, Travis, the reason I mentioned it. Can well, you this, is, that up? this is actually a different one, but I'll. Uh, OK, I'll, we'll just I'll, give them something that they can come sure. back to. So that was a lot to remember right then. If they had a picture, they could pause it and, you know, like that's that kind of thing. Is that uh, showing up as a large slide? Yeah. Yeah, real well. Is it the whole screen or is there stuff on the side? There's stuff on the side. It's not the whole screen. I'm trying to, to make it a, a slide. There we go. Now, let's see. And talking about the, the, the Old Testament background of Paul's thought of his understanding. Uh, while we're going to, of course, be looking at things in Daniel, which is really strong. And Paul is literally ver quoting Daniel verbatim. I mean, so if you look at the context in Daniel that Paul's going to quote here, in uh, verse 4 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I know we're going to look at that, so I won't go into that. But what a lot of people do overlook is in verse, I believe it's verse 8. Let me get it. But 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. Actually, then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Um, no, I, let's see. Let me, let me get it real quick. Super quick here. Uh, My whole point is that I, I, I'm simply trying to place this in the context. You have a young church. The Apostle Paul doesn't neglect to take the time to teach them that the coming of Christ is of the utmost importance as it cannot be misrepresented. And how does he tie you to it? He brings you the Antichrist. He brings you the Antichrist. And he begins to lay out how that is going to walk, work its way through there. So that it has, has to happen first, and which makes perfect sense. He says in verse five, do you not recall or remember that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. He'd been over this with them before. They could in no regard, in no way could they be teaching that the Lord is about to appear or has appeared. I think the rather better understood about to appear. It was clear that he had not yet appeared, um, but. That's a translation question and a context question. But of course, the Lord was about to appear. And yet Paul said, how can you how can you believe that unless you've completely forgotten what I laid down when I was with you earlier, what I went over with you? And so what I was going to refer to is that verse eight and then show that and notice, uh, at least in my translation here, there's a capital. It capitalizes the word wicked, that wicked W-I-C-K-E-D will be revealed who the Lord, whom the Lord will, will consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. That is almost a verbatim quotation out of Isaiah chapter 11, verse four. I will say, go, go get that. But in, in chapter of Isaiah 11, verse four, let me get it. I think I can get it pretty quick. It's speaking about the sky on or the stem out of Jesse. This is the Messiah, a branch and uh, shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom, of understanding, counsel, might, the spirit of knowledge, the fear of the Lord, and shall make him, this, this branch, this, this stem from Jesse, make him of quick understanding and the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But now this is clearly the Messiah. This is the one that we read about earlier in Isaiah chapter nine, a couple chapters earlier, who is the everlasting God, the Prince of Peace, it says, but with righteousness shall he, the stem of Jesse, the Messiah of Israel, the seed of David, judge the poor, reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. Now listen, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breast of, of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Now, in many translations, that is pr pronounced like, like generic, like plural, the wicked of the earth. But that's not what Paul is saying using he's using a septuagint translation that was very available and current at his time 
And in that, and I believe it's in keeping with other earlier versions, in that Septuagint, it says he will slay with the breath of his mouth that capital U or uppercase U, ungodly, uppercase one, or that capital W, wicked. He's talking about the personal Antichrist who is in other scriptures shown to be the Assyrian in chapters 8, 9, 10, again in 14. The ultimate Antichrist, according in Isaiah's perspective, was this one to the northeast of Israel, the Assyrian. And of course, this was the great type. Uh, and you see this with Micah. Micah is going to talk about this Assyrian in Micah chapter 5. This is the end time Antichrist that is destroyed when Messiah returns and the remnant of the brethren of, of, of the children of Israel are restored to the Lord and the kingdom of God is established on the earth. That's the context. So Paul is saying that the one that the Lord is going to slay with the breath of his lips is the Assyrian in chapter 11, verse 4 of Isaiah. And if you go on, you'll see what's described right after this is nothing less or other than the millennial period when the Jews in verse 11 on to the end of the chapter are being brought back from all nations as a completely saved people to enter into their promised inheritance once and forever. This is post-tribulational destruction of Antichrist in Isaiah chapter 11. That's what you see in 2 Thessalonians 2.8. Just to give you a little bit more of how much Paul is immersed in this Old Testament background. So, little interjection there. I no, think that's, that's good. I, that's I good. think that's pretty impressive. I mean, when I happened to cross that some years ago, I... I was taken quite aback to see that this is a personal figure, not just he's going to destroy the wicked with the breath of his mouth in general, though they will many be destroyed by the Lord's return, like you just read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 there. But this is actually talking about an individual. This is the last and final aggressor against Israel. That's who this Antichrist is. And you're right, Travis, he's obsessed with one thing. To situate himself and usurp and supplant the place that's appointed to Christ on Mount Zion. If you look at Psalm 2, God has appointed that his son to rule and reign with a rod of iron out of a restored, regenerated Mount Zion. Okay, and all the nations will be given him for a possession. Then you read in Isaiah, you know, other passages where the Antichrist is going to try to uh, take that mountain for himself. That's in Isaiah 14. That's in uh, Daniel 11, 45. That's, but where is this mountain? It's the beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north. I think that's Psalm 48, verse 2. And then in Isaiah 14, it says that the obsession of, of, of Satan is to sit upon the sides of the north. Well, that's not just somewhere off in the mystical heaven. That's, the, that's talking, that's the localized place. That's everywhere throughout the scriptures regarded as Mount Zion, the little hill of Mount Zion that is set apart for, for future glory and, and this, it is the locus of the future kingdom of God on earth. This is where Satan's design. And that's why the Antichrist is interested in those last days to, to recapture and possess and dominate Jerusalem and to call himself, you know, to, to, to deify himself in the temple of God at Jerusalem. This is deep stuff. You know, this is this is going all the way back to the beginning, the fall of Satan, Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, you know, that great background imagery for his original fall. He's had a design since the beginning to take the place that God decreed to give to his son, Psalm 2. Well, see, that's ultimately Paul's argument. Paul's argument here in 2 Thessalonians is that it's always been <laughs> in the plan of Satan to do something to possess the Temple Mount. And therein lies the problem. The problem is, is that how is it that we are to discern the timing of that event? Don't be deceived by a spirit, a word, or a letter as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. Why? Let me back you up and tell you what you must have is you must have the Antichrist revelation manifests itself in the temple of God. And unless you have that, then you're sitting here 
you're you're devoid of of the uh, the correct understanding, and so you can you can reach out your your feelers all over the place. You're just not going to be able to find the breadcrumbs throughout the scripture that God has laid down for you to follow the track of the way He wants you to go in this matter. So, you're ultimately just robbing yourself and any future generation of the body of Christ from from being armed against the great deception of the end time. Right. If you insert this into the place that Paul so carefully went over with you in his earlier visit to protect you from that great deception, be aware, look for this event, Jesus said, go and read about this in the book of Daniel. Know this, recognize this, you will see this, he says, when you therefore will see this event. So Paul had been over this with them because great deception is the, is the result of not being apprised of that. You might go off, well, oh, here he's there, or over here, or all the different diversions and the deception that's going to come at the end time. They're sitting ducks. They're setting themselves up for that deception. So it's more than just the fact that this, this distraction was dis diverting them from their temporal, you know, Christian responsibilities uh, and, and obsessing them with a, an event that was premature and not, you know, not, it was deeper than that, Travis. It was the deception that Jesus is warning against, that's what Paul sees at risk if they go on in this error. So he must rally with urgency to check and correct them in this. So let's just let's just run through some of those deception passages really quick, because what, what seems to be the, the interesting point here is that when Paul says the words, let no one deceive you by any means, he has the day will not come. That day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed. Jesus says the exact same thing, but the question becomes, what type of deception is being mentioned here? What type of deception is Paul trying to get at that he's warning these early Christian believers that they need to be on the lookout for? And I think the point is, is that it's the deception that is coming from false teaching. The false teaching says both uh, from Christ and from Paul that there's something to be avoided here by having a correct chronological aspect and a correct geolog uh, uh, geography concerning what it is that Satan's after and what is the timeline that he's on. He so can't he's, just... He's he can't just show up any place in the world and declare himself to be the Antichrist. He's got to go to the Jerusalem temple and proclaim himself to be God from that place. He has to be manifest at the perfect time, meaning in the final 70th week. He's got only 1260 days, according to the book of Revelation in several places, Daniel chapter 12. He's only got uh, and a certain amount of time, 42 months, three and a half years, in which to deal that deception out in the way that it's going to capture the whole of the world. So it's really quite a special deception that is taking place. So it's not just a normal deception would be my point. That, that's right. But what is the doctrine? What is the, the error that he's correcting that, that threatens to put them at risk, to sell them in? expose them to, uh, disarm them from that great deception. The is day of Christ has already come. Well, is it not something that we see taught everywhere? We see it taught by replacement theologians. We see it taught by, gee, almost everyone with the possible exception of the year date theorist. We see it taught by the pre-tribulational school. What is it? It's, the, it's a false doctrine of eminence. The doctrine of eminence that Christ could just show up right now today, crack the sky, and in the case of replacement, just the earth is burned up and the, there's a new heaven and new earth immediately. But in the case of the pre-tribulational view, the saints are taken up, the bride's taken away, and then the seven years starts. But in every case, the disarming thing is if, if, if we believe that Christ could just come any moment, we are opening ourselves to the danger that Jesus says is, is at risk if you do not recognize the events that he clearly says, and Paul says also, the events that will signal and let you know 
you know, that the Lord is really, truly about to come. And that's not going to happen until you see this man first. I don't know how you could emphasize that enough. The, if you have a doctrine of eminence, you are going to be disarmed and, and, and vulnerable, uh, at least to the great error that he's worried about. He doesn't want you to be unprepared for this. The, the, notice the urgency that's in his language. It's almost like the same urgency with Jesus. Take heed that no man deceive you. Paul sounds very much like that when he says, let no man deceive you by any means. This was not a little side issue for him. And so that. Yeah. Well, you know, so, so if you go to, if you go to Matthew chapter 24, you're going to see the verse four and five that we've already quoted. And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you for many will come in my name. So see what you were just talking about makes better sense because what are these people saying? They're showing up saying, I'm the Christ, or I am a type of the Christ. And Jesus says, don't be deceived by that. So many will come, many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and what? And will deceive many. Why would you be deceived about that? That, that becomes the problem. Why would you be deceived about that? Well, you would be deceived because you have nothing as far as a parameter to gauge whether or not this individual who has just done a miracle, perhaps a major miracle, that that individual could deceive you into believing that the power that is on display through them, a God granted power that you find in Revelation chapter 13, Daniel chapter seven, these things have to be looked at in that right context. He says it again in Matthew 24, 11, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. So here you've got someone who's saying, I'm the anointed one in verses four and five. I am the anointed one to come. Then you have someone else showing up and these people are false prophets that rise up. Now, this is a false prophetic ministry. They are pointing to two. That's what a prophet does. A prophet doesn't point to himself. A prophet points to something. He's the, the, the prophet of God throughout the whole of the Old Testament pointed you not to himself, but he pointed you to what the word of God was telling you. He pointed you to something beyond himself. These people are pointing you to the one who has come and is declaring that they are the false Christ because he's going to turn around in Matthew 24, 23 through 26. And he says, then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ. See, the word has already spread and gone out. And now, just like it spreads through the countryside, people are saying, he's over here. He's over here. Because it says, then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ or there, do not believe it. Why? For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Now, that's a giant statement. Even the elect. The deception that the false prophet is able to do because of the miracles of the false Christ and the miracles that he's doing is he's getting you to believe and fall under the sway of the devastation of this type of deception. So what's going to protect you? That, that's the question we're trying to solve. What's going to protect you? The Apostle Paul says, the man of sin has to come. And he says that day's not going to come unless there's a great falling away. So we have to discover in the text of the scripture what those two events are that's going to save us so that we can know something. So I'm suggesting to you that the answer falls in your chronology. Why? Because Paul's telling you false prophets and false people are going to arise, false Christs are going to arise, and they're going to arise at a certain time. They're not just coming on the scene at any other time. These are people who have been given a special ability to deceive. There is a restraint from, from the conscience of man that has been removed that has allowed then these people to fall under the incredible sway of this. 
because the Apostle Paul is going to say again, if we were to read it here in uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3, which we did, we could read it again in 2, 9 through 7. Listen to this. The coming of the lawless one, this is 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. Well, how does Satan work? With all power, signs, and lying wonders, and if and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Why are they perishing? Because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So don't tell me that there's not a cost involved for offending God when you had the opportunity to believe and press in. And notice the wording. They did not receive the love of the truth. It is an act of love for God to send his gospel out with such incredible displays. It's on, I mean, me and Brett were talking about it just a little bit ago. I've still got, you know, I still have a, a myriad and a scad of cassette tapes. I mean, we were listening to it back when it was on cassette, right? Well, we've got it in book form. We've got it in magazines. We've got it in tracks. We've got it in DVD. We've got it in MP3. We've got it in movies. We've got it in all manner of, of you can pick your phone up and listen for the rest of your natural born days, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, somebody telling you the gospel because it's all over the world. It's all over television. It's all over everywhere. That's the kindness and the love of God reaching out to you. And you'd rather go sit and watch or you'd rather go do or rather go be or rather go whatever it is that you're doing in the earth. Why? Because you don't love the God of the truth enough to walk away from some of the garbage in the world and give him some of your time. Give him a proper place in your heart to search the scriptures, to make sure that the deception that he's warned you about that's coming upon the face of the earth, all unrighteous signs, powers, lying wonders, and deception are going to fall upon these people who have no concept of the timing of these events, and they'll be swept away because it's as though even the elect could be swept away. They can't be, but it's going to be that strong in that day. There's going to be an outbreaking of the serious nature of the miraculous happening all around you as the demonic world has been cast out of heaven and they've taken up residence here and they're running the countrysides with all manner of false prophets and deception, deceiving all of these people in the world into buying into the one guy that they're pro proclaiming is the Christ or this supreme anointed one. So what are we going to do? We better get our nose in the book. We better take our time to figure out what God has given us to find the fail safes, right? Because Paul's warning you, Jesus is warning you, God the Father has given you his word. We have a responsibility to have already understood the material before the problem ever shows up. Anything you'd like to add to that? How about you, Brett? Thoughts? All good stuff. Um, I was thinking about uh, various things that you all were pointing out, but one uh, towards the end was, uh, you know, how we have been deceived in, in our time already uh, an example of a Canadian evangelist who set up shop in Florida. And we had leaders that, you know, if their names were mentioned, people would recognize them right away, who were, you know, well known and, 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 and well respected at the time, saying, pointing to this guy 
saying that he was, you know, the 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 this authentic John the Baptist, and he was this great man of God that was going to bring in, you know, the the so many things at the end of the age, and uh, turns out that you know he was having affairs with his assistant, and and after uh, it was revealed, you know, he ends up divorced, I think, and everything just fell apart. But it was, I knew many people who were rushing to Florida. They couldn't wait to get a ticket to go to Florida. Everybody was flocking from all over the world to, to see this, this phenomenon that was going on in Florida. And uh, it was, you know, many people called me, asked me, well, Brett, what do you think? What do you think? And, you know, and I just, it was an amazing event to, to watch from the outside, watching people flock to this person as if he was a, a bigger than life figure. And if, if that was possible, I don't know when that was, uh, 20 years ago or 15, uh, 25 years, I don't recall. I think it was probably 2000 and 2005, something like that. Uh, he, if that could happen then, you know, it could, it could happen in our day. Uh, so this warning, be not deceived, should be taken seriously. What's the nature? What's the nature, Brett? Reggie, what's the nature? See, I think we have to weigh something here. When Satan is cast out, Satan has an incredible presence about him. You can read it about it in the book of Revelation chapter 13. You can read about his, his presence. There are He allows the false prophet to do these things, these signs and wonders, while in his presence. And his presence is what grants them that power. And I suggest to you that it's an interesting thing in our own day. Because, see, God is omnipresent. And... You can be sitting in Minnesota and, and, and you can pray. And I'm here in Texas and Brett is, where are you at, Brett? Virginia? No, uh, Silver Spring, Maryland. Silver Spring, Maryland. That's what I thought. And, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> you can be sitting there, but we can all be partaking of the presence of God. And he can be touching us in a very real way. But you know, what is Satan going to be able to use in that day to create his omnipresence? He creates the work through a network of communication. And his presence goes out. Reggie's on it right now, ignoring us completely and never paying attention. And uh, I'm just kidding, brother. He's answering emails. I know how he does that. All I'm saying is, is, is you see these the the omnipresent aspect of what Satan's after is that he creates a cancel culture that is on social media able to be militant against people, but it's a display of his presence in one sense. But then there's also the miraculous nature of these signs and wonders. I've seen true authentic miracles happen where people got out of wheelchairs or blinded eyes saw or demons were cast out. I've seen those types of things for my own eyes. And there is a presence that is there when those things happen. Satan seeks to take advantage of that presence to make it to where in these miracles, there is a swaying of your, of your uh, natural mental processes that would cause you to question things, that would cause you to be alert or on guard or stick to the text of the scripture. There are those types of, I, I was reading the book of Mark earlier I've been reading it this week and just kind of looking at the ministry of Jesus. And what's so interesting about the book of Mark is the myriads and the multitudes of people that are around Jesus all the time. They can't eat. 
they they're the disciples and him constantly have to go away to quiet places they have to keep a boat ready for jesus to be able to have a va- an evacuation plan there's crowds all around him when j iris and the little woman with the issue of blood are there and there's the the just every blind bartimaeus he has to stop and command that he be brought. i mean there's this presence or this cr- this ability for people to sense and feel and see the person of the Son of God in a really amazing way because the miraculous is happening and it draws a crowd. It sucks people in. It brings them. Their curiosity arises and Jesus would go someplace and they were already out there going before him, telling them this person's coming. Well, is it going to be any different when you have false prophets doing amazing miracles. These are not just fake miracles. This is the miraculous of some sort. And what's going to happen? People are going to fall under the sway of these things. And they'll jettison what they've learned or what they've believed. If you're a nominal, whatever, a universalist or you know, you, you have all the kinds of, of problems that some of the other religious persuasions have in that day. You don't know the scripture. You're unversed in, in how to check or think about these matters. And what happens? You're sucked in. That's the overpowering prospect that the Apostle Paul is trying to save you from. That's the all point. All power. I'm... Paul says all power. The Antichrist that's revealed in the middle of the week by going into the temple and proclaiming himself above all gods, above everything that's worshipped. That is something that wasn't true of him before that time. Travis, the other day you said something to me that really, really captured. And that is, uh, you said that the false prophet had a power to do these things when he was in the sight or presence of the beast suggesting i've never thought of this before that this is only the only way that his power was equal to the power of the of the first beast who is the fullness of satan in the flesh is because he's in the presence of that power and that gives him his power to be equal in authority and able to bring that he's able to promote the great deception that will just deceive the whole world and so by the miracles and so forth but, you know, in, in Matthew 11, uh, 24, you see in verse 11, and many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And then in verse, uh, I think it's 24, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. And so much that if it were possible, and of course, if it were, is another issue, the very elect might have been deceived. So this is how close it's going to come. The seduction and the power is something that the world has literally never seen. Uh, We believe that at the same time the Antichrist is exalting himself in the temple of God to start the final tribulation. We know he takes away a sacrifice. We know he he places an image or abomination of himself. And then then the great uh, deception begins and the great tribulation begins. At that same time, we know from Daniel 12, 1 and Revelation 12, verse 7, Verse 7 through 14, that Satan has been cast down at that very time. That Satan is now has a little time on earth with great rage. He's concentrated. He's been stripped from his position in heaven. Michael, the, the great archangel, has stood up and cast Satan down. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Revelation 12, 12, for the, for the, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knows he has but a short time. Something very powerful has happened when this man is going into the temple. And at the same time, the the beast, now the other beast, the false prophet is being invested with this great power that he has to do, that he's able to do these miracles. And here's what you said in the sight of the beast. Yeah. It's, it's not clear that he could do those just anywhere. So it's about what you're saying. The, 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 this great aura of deception and so there's a release in in the realm of in the in the in the realm of heaven now what gives great analogy to this is the fact that you know there wasn't always in the courts of nebuchadnezzar or anyone else there wasn't anything like 
the magicians that were in the court of Pharaoh. They're called Janus and Jambres. Remember this? Remember the story? Yeah. They could duplicate almost everything up to a point that Moses and Aaron did. Here's Moses and Aaron. Unlike anything before them or after them, here are the two witnesses in Jerusalem. Unparalleled, this is an anointing on two men that are in the streets of Jerusalem. Here is the ultimate Janus and Jambres, able to completely call down fire from heaven. So it seems that when God gives a great release, Satan is jettisoned out of heaven. He's cast down. The Antichrist is suddenly empowered with all power. There's this incredible gush of, of pow the power of Satan to work all manner of deception. I'm not sure that was going on. In fact, I'm sure it's not going on at any time in the first half of the week or leading up to it. This is something that happens at that great transitional time in yeah. the middle of the week. Look at the things that are converging here. Satan, Satan, Michael is standing up, a time of trouble like has never been. Satan is being cast down. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. The man of sin is receiving all power. He didn't have that before. Second Thessalonians 2, verse uh, chapter 9, I believe it is. Uh, excuse me, verse 9, chapter 2, verse 9. So you're talking about the empowerment of the Antichrist, which is equivalent to the word reveal. The word reveal does not mean he's merely identified. He's already done certain actions, we know from Daniel, that can be clearly identified. But he's not yet revealed as the man of lawlessness until this great power comes upon him. And that happens in connection with Satan being cast down. And, there's, and this is in Daniel 8. It's in, it's, it's in other places where he has this great power that comes upon him. It's interesting that just like the two witnesses are receiving their power that we see in, in, in chapter 11 of Daniel, that the, that the masculine, those that are wise, the godly, the righteous, call them the godly remnant, those that have understanding will be strong and do exploits. They're receiving that power, interestingly, at the same time say, uh, the two witnesses is. My, my argument is that's what's going on. At the same time, the Antichrist and the false prophet are receiving their great power. So also are all these mighty prophets, false prophets. And the word Christ there isn't just you know, false messiahs. It means false anointings. Yeah. These people are anointed with the power of Satan. It's an anointing that, that, that is so deceptive, you know, and it supplants. It doesn't mean it's a fake Christ or something or a phony Christ. It's a supplanting of, of Christ, uh, the ultimate object of righteous worship and, and submission. So, in other words, there's a mystery going on here that seems to pivot and converge around the time of the middle of the week. And that's when, at the same time, proverbial all hell is breaking loose in, in, in Judea and sweeping through the earth. In terms of this final mark and the the uh, the the great persecution of Antichrist, that's so international, it it appears that that's the very time that this great power to deceive with these ultimate false signs. So this is not to say that these things are not a pattern that has see, been seen before. I mean, just like so much of the Olivet prophecy describes characteristics and traits of the general character of the age. But all of this seems to converge and concentrate with an ultimate intensity right there in the middle of the week. Right there when the Antichrist is revealed, there is a corresponding release. So just when Aaron and Moses is about to step in before, Mo, before Pharaoh, it's no happenstance that you have Janus and Jambres able to resist and withstand and have an alternative sideshow of the miraculous. So that as, as though to leave... Those who want an escape route, who don't want to receive the love of the truth, it leaves them a tangible, powerful alternative. You see what I'm suggesting? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's perfect. That's absolutely per well said. I uh, See, I was thinking you just, you just said there out of Revelation chapter 13, the, the, interesting, the interesting part about the, what Paul is telling you in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is, and this is why we're always so strong on maintaining that there has to be a temple. There has to be something that is visibly there is because the antichrist comes to the holy place of, of God. And what does he do? This is what the interesting point is, is that he declares himself to be God. Now in that declaration, there's a really, really interesting way in which the scripture says 
God manifests himself. I want you to think of Leviticus with me here in chapter 9. Then Aaron lifted his hand in verse 22. Then Aaron lifted his hand toward the people and blessed them and came down from offering the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the peace offering. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting and came out and blessed the people. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people, and fire came down out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. And so you have a miraculous ascension of fire that blooms the sacrifice and burns up all this stuff. It is the fire of God manifesting his presence. What is it that you see in Revelation 13? He performs great signs in verse 13, 13 through 15. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. It's not just bringing fire down. He's just declared himself to be God in the temple. And what is he doing? But he's now showing that he's God and that he's accepted by declaring and bringing fire to consume the offering that is made to him. And therefore, the deception is pervaded because people are thinking, this is a holy moment. This man has just declared himself to be God. He's just rose from the dead. Now he's standing in the temple declaring himself to be supreme above all creation, and he's now been given the gift of the sacrifice. So something spiritual in the heavens is agreeing with the declaration he's making on the earth is what they're seeing. So it's no different than Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18 when he's on top of Mount Carmel, and he says to the people, Therefore, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire. He is God. And that's the point I'm saying. This is a bit of a showdown that Satan is bringing about here, because what is that fire descending upon the sacrifice meant to do? It's meant to cause there to be a moment of the outpouring of the holy aura as you recognize that the spirit that is eternal, invisible, immortal is agreeing with what is happening and giving the seal of approval by lighting the sacrifice. That's the deception Satan's able to pervade throughout the whole of the world here. He says, and he even deceives those who dwell on the earth by the signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast and uh, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. That's why I'm suggesting to you that this is not simply just a localized event. It happens locally. The fire comes down in one place. It consumes something in one place. But then as life and breath is given to the image of the beast that was created for it, that takes upon itself a global tentacle that reaches out into all these different places in the earth because it somehow is able then to discover the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So it knows if you're somewhere else around the world and you're not worshiping it, then it's after you. Why? Because this is where the mark of the beast is going to come in. 
This is where immediately in the text of the of Revelation 13, the mark of the beast is going to come into play because now Satan is going to demand an allegiance from his followers. Take my mark upon you so that I know who you are and we know who's not with us. And by doing that, we can either force a conversion on them or force them to death, but it doesn't matter one way or another. You're either for me or you're against me. It says something is all I'm suggesting to you that Reggie said, you know, mentioned that, that, that point there. It's all, all the over powering presence of the word all in the manifestation of the signs and wonders. This is not just something that is just a cheap magician's trick. You know, this is a real honest to goodness. Watch it for yourself live on Fox and friends in the morning. When you get up having your coffee, it's going to be on Newsmax. It's going to be everywhere, everywhere you ever go to get any of your news. It's going to be televised. It's going to be visual. It's going to be put out there. It's going to be seen, and it's going to be accompanied in light of the great fear that has brought the Antichrist down in his invasion of northern Israel. He's there because he's been successful in invading northern Israel, and he's made it all the way down to the Temple Mount, and he's taken the Temple Mount, and now he's declaring himself to be God, which if we read the scriptures correctly, the way that we're looking at it, then there's already been a back and forth nuclear exchange. Chemical weapons have already been discharged. There's already you know, death floating in the sea. There's already blood in the sea. There's already a third of the ships destroyed in that sea. There's already a third of the rivers running red with blood and wormwood, poisonous water flowing to the rest of the peoples who are going to ingest it and die. There's already a giant fear that has taken place and everybody's looking. Just like we were all looking at 9-11 when every airplane shut down in the sky and everybody had their TV on and everywhere you turn and all the cameras panned, it was silent and people were staring at the TV screen. That's exactly what this day is going to be like, except for it's going to be far more troubling because you're going to see the whole world will be watching and they will witness a miracle of incredible proportion. As a man has been raised from the dead, nuclear weapons have been discharged, his armies have invaded and he has taken Israel, and now he's standing in the Temple Mount declaring himself to be God, and he calls down fire from heaven. His false prophet calls down fire from heaven, and what happens? All of a sudden, the sacrifice is consumed, meaning that the gods are accepting, and you're going to see people begin to go from that particular point forward into a state of absolute lawlessness as the false miracles, false prophets, and deception begin to pervade our culture like never before. Talk about deception. What if this man who goes to the temple and claims to be above all that's called God and is worshiped? So that he, as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, that's going to overturn every conceivable creed in the world. They're no match for the power of this deception. The, the Islamics say that God has no son. There's no, there's no incarnation. But this man, if he's, if he's God, he's incarnate God. You see what I mean? In other words, they're going to have to back off. Those who have creeds of all different kinds, different religions, will fall under the spell of this incredible power. Why? Because this man that's claiming to be God has just risen from the dead. Okay, now you say you, if you, if you perhaps have never heard that or you have objections to that on some ground that, that the dead can't rise or whatever unless God raises them, you need, should, you need to understand a couple of things. God is sending a strong delusion on the earth because they receive not the love of the truth. What if that strong illusion is God permitting with Satan being cast down at this very time by the standing up of Michael to start the tribulation? Daniel 12, 1, Revelation 12, 7 through 14. Very clear, parallel verses. What if the, 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 the now cast down Satan, he, he, he must take, he, he's, he's now confined to earth. Woe to those who 
inhabit the earth because Satan has come down having great rage. Revelation 12, 12. What if the instrument of that rage is indeed an antichrist and Satan has been forced to occupy this man who now has, has you know, been killed by a mortal wound that's unto death. He descends into the abyss, the bottomless pit. He's the same one that's going to ascend and then eventually kill the two witnesses. But the man who is being now divested of any of the remains of the, if anything, that's basically humanity. And, and he's now a beast. He's coming forth. And because he's been in this, in, in the mystery of God, somehow because this man is no longer, um, he, he's, he's, he's died and descended into the bottomless pit. When he comes forth, there's no more restraint. There, anything that would hinder the full expression of Satan through him. Just like because Jesus had no fallen nature, the full glory and power of the Father was able to be manifest in him with no hindrance, with no, with no you know, um, incompatibility. There is no incompatibility in this man's moral nature and his father, which is Satan. Satan now occupies this one, this man's body that was momentarily fallen and is able to rise and come forth in him as the fullness of of the of the mystery of iniquity just like jesus was the fullness of the godhead the manifestation of god in the flesh the mystery of godliness 1 timothy 3 16 i believe it is so this is the mystery of lawlessness fulfilled in the revelation of this man when satan takes up a full and unhindered unrestricted possession of this man so that now he's able to have a power like he never had before and deceive like he never did before can you imagine those that rejected the, the resurrection of Christ and then the great compelling evidence of the truth that will be in their face with the two witnesses and with the, with the many witnesses that are moving throughout the earth under great power? Okay, can you imagine that this, this the kind of deception that will convert people's creeds and bring them under such a powerful seduction that would have, would have even taken up the very elect had it been possible? And the only thing that would make it not possible is they've been prepared for this. They've been prepared for a deception like the world's never seen. And with that deception comes a proliferation of other false anointings and false prophets. And, and just like now that the spirit is being, you know, the Satan has been cast down, at the same time, the scripture is clear that there's an anointing coming on the true servants of God. So you're looking at a collision of kingdoms here, a clash of the great, what, what was before kind of in measure, is now in fullness among the people of God and among the children of darkness. And so now the great divide has come. And of course, there'll be a lot of people caught up in the middle and many will be saved and others will be sucked into the deception. But it says that the whole world marvels when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. You mentioned at the beginning that we have other friends and others who think this is merely the revival of the Roman Empire some say the Ottoman, but in other words, some some great uh, former dominion or empire is now being revived. But this is not some progressive return of a great empire. This is a, a spectacular, mind-boggling, overpowering event that causes all the world to marvel when they see a beast that was mortally wounded, then disappears, is not, and now again is. Why? Because he comes forth in the fullness of the power of Satan. And he has a short time. He has a short space. Revelation 17, a short time. Revelation 12, 12. This is that 42 months that he has this unparalleled power to dominate. And it's granted to him to persecute the saints. And of course, his great obsession is what do we know? To stop the children of Israel to come to their goal, to their, to their destiny. So he's out to destroy the woman, to stop the Jewish people from coming from a remnant surviving to come to that appointed day when all Israel will be saved and they look upon him whom they pierced. He's got to stop that. He's not in a hurry to get into the body of the Antichrist because when he does, he knows his time is short. But when he is cast out, he has nowhere else to go. And so now the one thing left to him is to stop Israel from their destiny. And of course, he's, he's out to destroy everything is sympathetic or supportive of Israel. He's an ultimate anti-Semite. 
hates the saints because of their love for Israel. And um, it's, it's, it's incredible. So the great question here is we read about this, this uh, deception in, in the Olivet Prophecy. We read about it in Daniel. There's nothing in Daniel. There's, in Daniel, there was a great deal about something really overwhelmingly powerful comes on this man. But it doesn't tell you it's an actual resurrection. But the book of Revelation does. It does tell you that. And, and it tells you why. Because Satan has been holding back the mystery of godly, uh, the mystery of lawlessness, somehow by his position in heaven, only when he's removed is the kingdom of God able now to come. Christ can now come because why? Because the mystery of lawlessness has been revealed. Everything waits. History waits. The kingdom of God waits. The return of Christ waits for this great revelation of the mystery of lawlessness, which works this final great deception which is God's judgment on an, a, a Christ-rejecting world that receives not the love of the truth. There's the logic of this. And that's why we really believe there is actually a literal resurrection that is in view in these passages. There's very little explanation elsewise for those. A beast that was and is not yet, this, this raised by a mortal wound, has all power. I could go on. I mean, I can't even remember all the cumulative evidence that seems to support and point to a literal, real resurrection that will be so bedazzling, spectacular, and overwhelming as to deceive everyone whose names are not written in the book of life. And that is where we're going to have to leave it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because as you're very fond of hearing when you visit with us, the clock is never our friend. <coughs> However, this is beautiful because it's a great segue into where we'd like to go next is because what is so little explored but the resurrection of the Antichrist? So perhaps we can look at that in some greater detail as we move forward. But Brother Brett, would you be so kind, my friend, as to close us out in prayer? Wow. Well, Father, we, we humble ourselves under your mighty hand. And we beseech you, Lord, to, to help us. To grant us a love for the truth. To grant us grace to, to know the events, the, 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 as, as Travis has said, the timeline of events that must take place before the day of the Lord. But Lord, grant us grace and protection from this spirit of delusion, this spirit of deception that, that even now is among us in the earth. That's right. But will be even stronger. It gets stronger every day as, as, as we can all witness in the news or in our neighborhoods. Grant us wisdom. Grant us help. Let the Holy Spirit come and help us to walk in the truth, to walk in the light, to walk in, in, in that light that exposes the darkness, yes. that exposes the lie, that exposes the deception. Great and small ways. Help us, Lord, not only for ourselves, but help us to help others. We thank you for the timeline and the, the warnings but there, there's more that's needed. We need more. And we thank you for granting it to us. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, of course, thank you all for joining us. And we are so incredibly blessed to be able to uh, get back. We pray that uh, in God's kind mercy, you'll take these things and make them your own and spend some time with the scripture, looking at uh, what we've said and judge for yourself. And we look forward to seeing you again. May the Lord bless you. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.